How's everybody doing? Oh, it's good to see you. It is so good to see you today. Thanks for being in church. Today's a big day. I want to make sure you understand how big of a day today is. Something in San Diego that hasn't happened in coming up on 14 years has the potential of happening today. Okay? Does anyone know what that is? Don't. Yep. Okay. Okay. The Padres can clinch a playoff berth with a win today. We've been praying, right? It's a miracle. We've been praying, and look what's happening. Thank you, Lord. Prayers are being answered. Hey, a couple things happening. Uh, one, in the lobby, you'll notice voter registration. Okay, really important to you get yourself registered if you're not. And it's very clear, isn't it? This election season, the divide between the two main parties is wider than ever. And listen, we're going to help you understand uh, what the issues are. Uh, here coming up, you'll, you'll be seeing the dates here pretty soon. And, and like next week, we'll let you know the actual dates. We're going to have a fill out your ballot a couple of Sundays after church. You can go in the chapel and we'll walk you through uh, you know, who is, is believing in this and who is doing this and that. So that you'll, ha- you'll be informed because it's confusing, isn't it? When you look at all the things to vote for and you're going, well, that one says that and that looks like that. So what do I do? Well, we're going to let you get to know um, those issues, the issues that are out there, because I tell you, it's important. I do believe, you know, we're not going to force anyone to vote whatever way you want to vote, but I do think it's very important as a Bible-believing Christian that you vote for those people that have biblical, moral values that follow what God would say. I think that's important. And I want to be very clear, I fully recognize in a church our size uh, that we have people that are Democrats and we have Republicans and we have Independents and we have Green Party. I'm sure we have all of the different parties represented. My goal is not to divide, right? Because Politics has a way of dividing. That's why it's called politics everyone off. That's why it's <laughs> really what it is. And so we want to make sure we, we're, we're unified in being a church. But my goal is to make sure you are informed. Okay, and we're going to, again, help you fill out that ballot if you'd like, and we'll have some information on that. I think it's just so important. We need people in office that will fight for your rights. We need people who are in office that will fight for the unborn. We need people who are in office who will fight for our religious freedoms. We need people in office that are like Bill Wells, the mayor of El Cajon, who I want to introduce you to if you don't know him. Bill, come on up. Bill is someone who uh, is a Skyline Church member, but also is fighting for you. And so El Cajon is open, and I wanted to have Bill talk a little bit about what prompted you to go against the tide, because that's what you're doing. And as a leader, that's what we're called to do. We do what's best for our people. So what prompted you to say, we're open, we're going to open? Well, when this whole thing started, I stood up with the county, and I I said, we've got to flatten the curve, and we've got to be careful, and we've got to make sure we have enough ICU beds and ventilators. But then two weeks turned into several months, and I realized that it wasn't about what it was supposed to be about anymore. Exactly. And um, people were coming to me and saying, can you help me? My, my business is closing. I can't pay my mortgage. I haven't seen my mom in three months. I've got a brother who's back in alcoholism. I've got somebody who's suicidal. And I realized that there were so many people that were just hurting so badly and asking for help, there was very little I could do. And I didn't want to be like everybody else and say, well, that's the governor or that's the county. So I decided that we should do something that admittedly was mostly symbolic. But I wanted to reach out and say, you're not crazy. Your, your feelings are very understandable at this time. And your belief system that you're being maltreated is not wrong. And so I wanted to stand up for people and have solidarity with them. So that's what we did. Fantastic. That's... And what has been the reaction so far? You know, I've, 
probably got 5,000 emails. Uh, about 95% of them have been really great, super nice. All I know you guys are praying for me. My wife, Betty, and I, we appreciate it. There have been a few people, about 5%, that want me, like, really dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Welcome I mean, to the club. Really vitriolic. Yeah, yes. Well, but, how can we pray for you? What are a couple things that we can do to pray for you? Well, first off, pray for the people of El Cajon, the people of this region. They're suffering. I know that when I say they, I'm talking about you, all of us. People are really, really suffering right now. But also pray for me that I can stay ahead of this, make good decisions, and uh, be a good representative of you in this fight that I think will continue for a while. Yeah. Amen. As, as just showing that you're with us in prayer, would you just extend your hand and I'm going to pray over Mayor Wells. Lord, we ask, first of all, relieve the suffering of so many. So many businesses close and not being able to reopen. So many guidelines, so many mandates. We ask, Lord, please. Allow us to open up again. We believe we can do that very safely. Relieve the suffering of our region. Relieve the suffering of our nation. And then we pray for wisdom for Mayor Wells and his family. We pray, give him godly wisdom to continue to make those correct decisions, even though they go against the tide of our local government and our national government. And we understand that. Our state government, we understand that. But God, leading is difficult. It means going against the tide because you care about your people more than some mandate. And so we pray, give him wisdom as he moves forward. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Amen. everybody. Thank, thanks, Pastor. Thank you so much. Love you. Thank you, thank you. All right, guys, we're in the series on the end times. And if you're brand new, it's kind of a heavy topic. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're new. And, and we just dove into this thing on the end times. It is, you know, it, it, it's, it's content rich. And, you know, I'm sensitive to the fact that some of you are just checking out the church and all that. And we're in this deep series on this whole thing. But it's important. It's important we talk about these subjects. It's important that the book of Revelation is talked about. You're not going to hear it very often in places. And so uh, it's important that we, we look at this. And then when you tie it into kind of what's going on these days, there's some really clear and even easy, obvious things to be able to say, this is what's going on. So I want, my goal is to keep you informed. I think I mentioned this last week as a pastor, as a shepherd, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to, one, protect the flock. We're supposed to inform the flock. We're supposed to make sure that we keep people abreast of the truth of what, what is happening. And then also we're to warn the flock. And so this, this message series, there's a lot of warnings in it because it, it's from Revelation. And so far, we've taken a, a look at the various aspects of the end times, okay? And I talked to you in the very first couple of messages about the signs of the end of the world. And we looked at what the Bible says about the things that are going to be happening and ramping up. You remember we talked about the birth pains. Jesus actually talks about that. That as the end of the world happens, there's going to be these contractions, these painful things that happen, like pandemics, like wars, and like these things that cause people to go, oh, and then what's going to happen is there's going to be a calm. There's going to be a season of calm. Right now we're in this, ah, uh, can we please get out of this pandemic? And after November 3rd, we're going to be able to go, ah, oh, okay, right? I mean, we all know. And so, so that's kind of the way. But right after that, it's not going to be very long. There's going to be something else that's going to be a contraction. We're going to be like, ah, oh, ah. Oh. And, and that's the way it goes. And it ramps up more and more. It might be a wildfire. It might be earthquakes or hurricanes or whatever. Natural disasters, Jesus talked about. These things are going to be ramped up more and more as the end of the world gets closer and closer. And then I talked to you about the rapture, the instantaneous act of God where he removes believers from the earth before the tribulation. Last week we talked about the first part of the tribulation, first message in the tribulation. And we talked about this hellish time on the planet that goes for three and a half years. Really bad things are happening. In the last three and a half years, it's even worse. So that catches you up. And I want you to know what we're going to be talking about today. Both We're going to be looking at two things. One, we're going to be looking at the different judgments of the tribulation. And then we're going to also look at the figure known as the Antichrist. Okay, we're going to look at some of his characteristics. We're going to look at some of the things that are happening today that might tie into some of the things at the end of the world. What we're talking about 
is something known as prophecy. Whenever you see future predictions in the Bible, it's known as prophecy. That's your first fill-in. Future predictions, prophecy. The study of prophecy is a big one. As a matter of fact, 27% of the biblical content is prophecy. Sometimes people will say, ah, the Bible's an old book. It just deals with the past. And, you know, what do I need to get in there for? No, no, no. 20% of the biblical books are prophetic books. It's important that we understand what the Bible says about what's going to happen. Jesus wants us informed. He wants to make sure we know what's going on. So, now speaking of the dark times of the tribulation that Jesus talks about, there's an interesting thing in Matthew chapter 24 where three verses give a little bit of a timeline. Matthew 24, 7 and 8 says it like this, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. There's that thing. There's that, that, that verse I mentioned. And as time ramps up, he tells us what's going to happen next. A few verses later, for then there will be great tribulation such as never been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. This is a brutal time. And then he tells us at the end of the tribulation, when it's coming to an end, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Something happens at the end of the tribulation that I look forward to talking to you about. We still got several messages in this series, and we're going to talk about at the end of the tribulation what happens. So it's going to be great. Today, let's look at the tribulation judgments and the Antichrist characteristics. When it comes to the judgments of the tribulation, the things that are going to take place, each of these are ramped up. You're going to notice this. There's three different sets of sevens. These things are ramped up. And the first of the three sevens that are released in these judgments during the tribulation is the seven seals. The seven seals. And you're going to find these seals explained in Revelation 6. And I put the references there as well as Revelation 8. The Bible talks about the seals being broken. And there's certain things that are loosed. On the earth. Now, when I say seals, I'm not talking about the animals like SeaWorld. You know, some people, why are the animals involved like that? No, no. We're talking about these seals that are being broken. The first seal is the white horse. It's representative of the Antichrist. The Antichrist rises to power within a very short time, pretty short time of the tribulation starting. This Antichrist rises to power. He comes to power as the world is in chaos and disarray right after the rapture. Christians are gone, and there's chaos. There's incredible chaos, one, because of all the things that happen when the rapture happened, whether it's Christians flying airplanes, Christians driving cars. You can just bam, bam, bam. All this chaos is happening. Second seal is a red horse. That's war. War is breaking out all over the earth. The third seal is a black horse. That's a famine breaking out all over the earth. Food shortages. Now listen, people are going to be killing each other over food. They're going to be trying to get food and killing each other. The fourth seal is a pale horse represented by death and hell, hell coming to earth. In other words, people that don't know Jesus that are getting killed during the tribulation are sent straight to hell. The fifth seal is the martyrs. Those are people that have been killed for their faith in Christ over the years. It gives you a little glimpse into heaven if you read this. And the martyrs are crying out, Lord, when's our redemption? Like, when are you going to pay them back for what they did to us? And the Lord says, just wait a little longer. A little longer is coming to an end. And it gives us a little idea, too, of the great reward that martyrs have for keeping their faith. And then the sixth seal is universal upheaval and destruction. There is a great earthquake like has never happened before, and there are meteors hitting the earth at this point. It's, it, it's, are we having fun yet? I mean, you know, it's like, wow. And this is just the first set of these things. All right, and today I want you to buckle up a little bit. It's a little bit longer of a message, so uh, if you need some extra coffee, just wave one of the waiters and they'll come and get it for you. All right? I'm <laughs> just kidding. We don't have waiters. People are watching waiters. Anyway, all right, then the seventh seal leads us into the seven trumpets, okay? And it's an angel. Seven angels are given seven trumpets. And, and here we go. Seven trumpets. The first trumpet, huge hailstones, mixed with blood and fire so that one-third of all the vegetation on earth is destroyed. That means all the tree, one-third of the trees and one-third of the grass and one-third of vegetation is destroyed. The second trumpet is a fireball from heaven and one-third of the ocean 
is polluted. You can imagine, one-third of the living creatures in the ocean die, and one-third of the ships on the ocean are destroyed. Now, you can imagine, when we, remember we talk about hunger, there's going to be incredible hunger. Well, one of our main food sources is the ocean. And you can see already one-third is polluted, and one-third is no good. The third trumpet, falling star, hits one-third, hits the earth, and one-third of the fresh water is now polluted. And so then our freshwater food sources are now polluted to one-third degree. The fifth trumpet, at this point, things shift from bad to worse. As a matter of fact, Revelation 8, an angel goes around announcing how bad it's going to be. This is the second part of the tribulation. It's getting bad. Now, Revelation 9, 1 through 6, I got a few verses I want to read. It says this, the fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. And when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. Verse 3, And out of the smoke locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, which is what they would normally do. But only those people who, look, look what it says, did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of a sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. You notice it says there that those during that time that do not have the seal of God on their forehead. It's interesting because this is one of the verses that mid-trib and post-trib theologians will use to say, see, we have to go through the tribulation. No, no, no. Remember, people are coming to say yes to Jesus during the tribulation. God marks them with a seal. It'd be a spiritual seal. I don't think it's a literal, you know, something outside. It is a spiritual seal, and they are sealed for God, and they will not be harmed by these judgments during that time. It's a brutal time on earth, and there's more to come. (laughs) We move on to the next set of judgments known as the seven bowl judgments. These are the seven bowls. At this point, the Antichrist has risen to power, and there are many, many people who are following him. There are many, many people who are worshiping him at this point. The first bowl, Revelation 16, 2, says it like this. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly festering sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. The second bowl, every living thing in the ocean dies. So the rest of the two-thirds, gone. The third bowl, every living thing in freshwater, lakes, rivers, and basins die. So now our, the food source is gone from, from the water. The fourth bowl is poured out, Revelation 16, 8 through 9. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. The fifth bowl, the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. Listen, but they refused to repent of what they had done. You follow? Sometimes people will say, how could a good God... Send people to heaven. I mean, send people to heaven. Send people to hell. And we, we know the answer. God doesn't send people there. People actually choose to go there. People actually say, I don't want anything to do with you, God. And so God sends them to the farthest place away from his presence. Okay? And, and you need to look at this. Remember, we said it last week. God, man, he, he loves us so much. You can go through your whole life and not acknowledge God. And a lot of people not only don't acknowledge him, they hate him. They put him at arm's length, and so the tribulation is the final wake-up call. Wake up. I love you. I need you. I want you in heaven. And he's yelling at these people, and they still refuse to come to Christ. They refuse. The sixth bowl will be Armageddon, and we'll talk about that later on in the message. Not this message, but later another message. The seventh bowl is earthquakes and 100-pound hailstones hurled to the earth. And then the tribulation is coming to an end at this point. But first, let's talk more about the Antichrist, the characteristics of the Antichrist. Okay, now we flip to the Old Testament. We see a prophecy in Daniel. 
You'll see prophecy in Ezekiel. You'll see it in Isaiah and other places. A lot of times people will say, ah, the Old Testament's out. Out with the Old Testament. We don't even need to pay attention. It's just a new Testament. No, no, no. The Old and the New are intertwined. A lot of prophecies in the Old Testament that deal with New Testament times, but also current times. We can't, we can't kick the Old Testament out and just focus on the New. They both go together very prophetically. It's very powerful. So here's some characteristics. He, Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. What's that seven? That's seven years, the, the length of the tribulation. Okay, remember, this is the book of Daniel. In the middle of the seven, what's the middle of seven? Three and a half, right? Three and a half years. In the middle of seven, he's going to put an end to the sacrifice and offering. You go, what is that? We're going to talk deeper at this in another message. But he makes a deal with Israel. He makes a deal. And there's a time of peace where the temple is rebuilt. Their sacrifices and offerings are brought back. And he's made that deal with them for the first three and a half years. He made a seven-year deal. But the three, at, at the end of three and a half years, he breaks that deal with Israel. In the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. He puts himself up as God, and he demands to be worshipped as God. Until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So for frame of reference, the Antichrist is known as the beast also for Christians, for us studying this stuff, that he won't be called the beast during tribulation or the Antichrist. In case you were wondering, that'd be a little too obvious, wouldn't it? So you'll hear those names or man of lawlessness. You'll hear that throughout scripture, things we talk about. It's not going to be his actual name. Now, so let's take a look at these characteristics. And the first question that comes to people's minds is, what is the guy going to look like, right? Some people think he has a certain look like horns or a forked tail or fiery eyes. I'll tell you what people in California think he looks like right now. Let's just take a look at that. That's what, that's what a lot of people in California think he looks like. Man, let's, let's take a look at another picture. This is when he's letting you know how big you are. He's, he's just like, you're nothing. I'm everything. You're nothing. And then this last one is when his chief of staff told him that, that everyone believes what he's saying about everything. And he's like, yeah. all right, he's changed over 400 laws, guys. He's changed during this pandemic, during his emergency order, he has changed over 400 laws, laws that were put into place through the legislative process, through voting, and with one stroke of his pen, because we are in a supposed emergency situation, his executive orders are over 400 strong now, coming up on 500, where he has changed the laws of California with a stroke of the pen. This cannot go on. So, People have asked, is he the Antichrist? And I can tell you that although he's acting and he is doing things very consistent with the Antichrist, he is not the Antichrist, okay? And it really is a great reminder and very convicting, isn't it, that we need to pray for him. We need to pray for our governmental leaders. It is commanded in Scripture. It is not easy, especially in a situation like this. But as a Christian, it is required. We are to pray for them. And perhaps if we would, listen, I, I'm preaching to myself even. If we would pray as much as we complained about them, maybe God would move his heart. So let's, let's work on that, right? Amen. Let's take a look at how Daniel describes Gavin Newsom. Ah! The Antichrist. I'm sorry that slipped. The Antichrist. 8.23, the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue, will arise. Interesting. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. This is Israel he's talking about here. He will cause deceit to prosper, and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes, against Jesus. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. Listen to what it says, verse 26. The vision of the evenings and mornings the angel had given him that has been given to you is true. But seal up the vision, for it concerns a time in the distant future. This was written in 600 B.C. 
Think about that. This was written in 600 BC, 2,600 years before today. It said distant future. How distant? We don't know. But we're definitely in the distant future. Wouldn't you agree? (laughs) Okay, and then you look at Revelation. It was written between 90 and 95 AD. And you look at the prophecies in Revelation that match up with the prophecies in Daniel, and it is amazing how they're just like that. Just like that. That's why the old and the new, so important to have both. Characteristics, I got these in your notes. Characteristics of the Antichrist, he's going to be an intellectual genius. He's no dummy. Very smart, incredible intellect. A successful orator. In other words, when he speaks, people listen. As a matter of fact, the Bible says people are going to love listening to him. They can't wait for him to have another speech. He's so good at speaking. Third, he's going to be a political genius. He knows how to work the system. He knows how to get people rallied behind him. He knows how to work the political system. Four, he's a business genius. Five, he's a military genius. Militarily strategic, smart, smart guy. Six, he's a religious genius. He knows the core of religion, which is our innate sense and need to worship something. The fact is, everybody worships something. Whether you're Christian or not, if you're a non-Christian, you worship something else. You may not call it worship, but whatever you focus on is what you worship. For a lot of non-Christians, it might be money, sex, drugs, rock and roll, whatever it is. It's something you worship. It's something you focus on. And he knows this, and that's how he gets people to worship him. Fourth section is the mark of the beast, the Antichrist. He will conquer and become a world leader, listen to this, through diplomacy. A lot of times we think he's just going to be militarily overpower everybody. No, no, no. The reason people are going to follow him is he's so smart. He is going to have the answers. He's going to bring countries together through various peace accords and peace deals. He's going to have these incredible speeches that really help him conquer the world. He's going to come with the facade of peace for those three and a half years. It's the facade of peace. He brings the world together after the chaos of the rapture. People will be enamored with him. He'll seem to have all the ideas. He has a solution to world hunger, to poverty, to the global economic crisis. And he's going to have the answer to peace through a one world religion. You say, how could that be possible? There's a lie out there that says religion has caused all the major wars over the history of the world. That's not true. It's caused wars. Religion, for sure, has caused wars. But when you look at history, the vast majority, the majority of wars have been caused by selfish dictators who want to rule the world. But he's going to use the rumor that religion has caused all these wars to unify the world through a one-world religion. You say, that's impossible. How is that going to happen? Well, think about it. What's going to be happening? He already has the answer to poverty. He already has the answer to hunger. Remember, people were starving and killing themselves? He found an answer. Okay, he's going to have the answer to the economic crisis. He's going to have all these answers. Then he's going to institute this one-world religion. He's going to say to everybody, hey, let's all get along, okay? And everyone's going to go, well, yeah, we agree. We need to all get along. Let's have a one-world religion religion. So he's going to do that. But you're going to need to receive a mark on your body to show your allegiance to this one world system. And I want you to write this down. It is going to be a universal sign to show that you care. I'm going to explain this. It's going to show that you care. Where have we heard that before? It will not be unlike what we're experiencing today. The mask mandates are the same kind of rhetoric that will be happening to set up a universal mark during the tribulation. Here's what I mean. Right now, mask shaming is very common. Now, again, if you want to wear one, absolutely great for you to wear one. If you are sick, please wear one. But if you are healthy, why do you have to wear one? If if you're healthy and someone else is sick and they're wearing a mask, what, what are they afraid of? If someone else is wearing one and they feel protected, why why does a healthy person have to wear a mask? Isn't it interesting? If you do not wear one, then you should have the freedom to make that decision. (laughs) 
if you're more comfortable wearing one. We've said it from the beginning. We're glad for you to wear a mask if you want to. There's no problem with that. Absolutely. A lot of people have health issues. You should wear one. You know, if you've got underlying health conditions and you've got all these things going on, it's a good idea to do that, right? And again, it's, if that's the case, then what is it really about? If it's not about the mask, then it must be about control. It must be. And the science does not back up the rhetoric or the propaganda being pushed by the mask militia. The commercials and the constant bombardment of our public officials has gone too far. They make you feel like if you don't wear a mask, you don't care about other people. That's the rhetoric that's out there right now. And it doesn't even pass the test of common sense. If you look at what the box says when you buy masks, look at it. This product is an ear loop mask. This product is not a respirator and will not provide what? Any protection against COVID-19, coronavirus, or other viruses or contaminants. That's what you get on a box. And yet, wear a mask. Mask shaming. We've experienced it personally. Mask shaming. My son was hunted down, walked through a restaurant down at Liberty Station, walked through a restaurant, and one of the employees hunted him down, waited for him to get out of the bathroom, and was yelling at him, called him names. And we're like, what is going on? This is ridiculous. Even the vaunted N95 masks are not guaranteed to stop the virus. Why? Because it's stated on the box, N95 masks stop viral microns down to 0.3 microns. The COVID-19 virus is 0.1 microns. Now, for those of us that aren't that good at math, that means that's a lot smaller than the mask can protect against. It gets through the mask regardless. And so why are we doing this? You're being conditioned. We have to understand this. We're being conditioned. You think, I would never take a mark. There's going to be people that absolutely get in line for that. Why? Because I want to show I care. I'm part of the system. I'm part of the system. I, I want to show that I, I care. Now, I'm going to say it again. Masks are not useless. I'm not saying that. Masks can protect against pollen, which is 10 microns. It can protect against some bacteria, which is three microns. That's why our doctors and nurses wear them. It's very important in a hospital. There's bacteria, and it protects against those. And so that's important. But this is a virus, <laughs> and it doesn't protect against the thing that they're telling us to put the masks on for. And I'm very sensitive to our church that's in San Francisco area, Pacifica, because the mandates there are even stronger than they are here. And I'm not trying to divide us. I think it's very important that we understand that. If you feel more comfortable wearing a mask, wear one. No problem. Okay? And if you, it's okay. I highly recommend wearing a mask for certain people. And well, that didn't sound right. I mean, <laughs> what I mean is for people underlying health conditions that feel like, it, you know, they don't feel comfortable out and about, that's okay. Even people with sensitive allergies during allergy season. And of course, people who are sick, but it won't stop the virus. So we have to stop consenting to what is going on around us. Folks, nothing changes until you push back. Nothing changes. Especially in California, you have to recognize and realize Okay, they, the governor and others, are supposed to work for us. It, that has been completely flip-flopped. It's still we, the people. Our Constitution is being trashed right now. That's very true in California. I think there's plenty of lawsuits against him. I hope they all come to fruition. But th what's happening is actually criminal right now. And in, in the longer we put up with it, the longer it's going to go on. And, and that's why I'm so thankful for Mayor Wells. I'm thankful for other communities that are opening up. And I did hear there is a county board of supervisors emergency meeting on Tuesday. 
Um, I also heard on Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock at the county administration on the west side, there's going to be a gathering of business owners and small business and just people who are sick and tired of being sick and tired of this. And Jim Desmond, Supervisor Desmond, is going to be there to, to talk. And it would be great if you want to go down to that and just show your support uh, for opening up San Diego. Because I don't know if you heard, but we're supposed to go into the next tier. So... We're, we're supposed to go into that more strict tier coming up here, and our county board of supervisors are meeting to figure out options, because if we go back into that purple tier, guess what? You're forced again, only outside stuff. That's it, and, and more restrictions and more craziness. So during the tribulation, if you want to buy or sell anything or get food or medical care, you're going to have to show that you're a good citizen. You're going to have to show that you're on the team. Well, how do you do that? You're going to have the mark of the beast. Again, it's not called the mark of the beast. You won't have a number 666 on your hand. It's not like that. Okay, it will be a mark on your body that identifies you as someone who is a follower of the Antichrist. By taking the mark, you're going to be considered a good citizen. You're going to be considered someone who cares about others. That's how it is pitched. So when we talk about the mark of the beast, not too long ago, this really would have seemed impossible and it really would have seemed pretty crazy. But now, with RFID technology, how many are familiar with radio frequency identification? Okay, handful of you. Let me give you an education on that. Okay, it's already in our animals, right? Like if you have an animal like we do, we got one from the rescue years ago, and they put a chip in, in the animal. And uh, it's actually gotten our dog back to us a couple of times when our dog got out. And then uh, animal control just does a little beep on the chip, and it tells the information. You know, it's the McGarity family. They don't care about their dog because they let it out again. Let's go, right? Gives you all that information. And then they tell you, come get your dog. Okay, so RFID technology is already out there. And as a matter of fact, I don't know if you know this, but it was first implanted into cats. And so cats started this whole, this whole thing. And I got a picture. I got a picture of the Antichrist with his favorite animal. See? That's, what, that's where it all started. Golly. All right. In many ways, this kind of technology is already happening. It's already all around us. If you have a cell phone, you're tracked. In location services tracks you. I'm not here to scare you. That's something that we use all the time, right? We got apps for our kids. We want to know where they're at, and it tracks us. Not only does it track us, but it also listens to you. There's algorithms set up so that when you are talking about something, Maybe something you like. I'll give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I stayed at a place where I, I just, I was impressed with the shower head. It's hard for me when I go to places to get a shower head that's tall enough, okay? And then it, it was real big and it, it was like rain coming down. It was fantastic. And so I told my wife, we're just sitting around and I told my wife, I said, man, that shower head is amazing. It's like rain falling the right volume. It felt great. Well, guess what? Later on, she's scrolling through Instagram, same day. And guess what advertisements popped up on her phone? Yeah, shower heads. Now, we didn't search Amazon. We didn't Google it. We were just talking. What came up were advertisements for shower heads, not just any kind of shower head, shower heads that felt, feel like rain. I looked at that. I was like, doo -doo 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 -doo. And, and then I was like, wow. And then my oldest son, they were in there. Uh, he was in the car with his girlfriend and they were talking. He goes, wouldn't it be fun to take surfing lessons? Guess what a little while later was popping up on his phone? All the places where you can get surfing lessons in San Diego. Now, I tell you that because the technology is already there. I have friends, a couple of friends that work in, in big data companies. And he explained this to me, what happens, right? When you turn on location services, when you use certain apps, and it, and it, it allows them to get, gather information from you. Uh, and I'm not saying someone's on the other phone going, hey, uh, McGarity likes shower heads. Let's throw him some advertisements. <laughs> No, no, it's algorithm. It's all digital. It's all automatic. And so what happens is, like my friend told me, is they'll gather that data and then using GPS and knowing what stores are around, you could be walking by a store, something you talked about, and an ad will pop up. And it'll just be like, whoa, look at, hey, there's that. They do that on purpose. Companies hire them to do that. Many of you know this. They, they hire companies to do that to get more sales because it's more likely if you're right there, something you've already talked about, and you're right there by the store, you'll go in and, and purchase more items. So the technology, this isn't a surprise to us about this whole idea of a mark of the beast. It shouldn't be 
surprising at all. And the point is we're not too far away from what will be happening during the tribulation. Tracking, tracing, following, control, not freedom. We hear a lot about tracking and tracing today, don't we? So when it comes to RFID technology, many have already taken it in their body. You can look this stuff up, but I'll give you a few articles that talk about it. This is from creditloan.com article. The chip implant is a highly advanced technology in credit cards and smart cards. We already know that. A U.S. company introduced rice grain-sized chips as a mode of payment. Despite the company's previously criticized proposal to implant GPS systems inside people, However, the company said that its VeriPay system, based on radio frequency identification, RFID technology, listen, might be the only solution to end identity theft. So you, you can bet how this is getting set up. If you don't take the chip, let's say it's a chip, if you don't take the chip, are you a thief? What, you don't, you don't care about other people? Are you going to try to steal their identity? Don't you care about others? You should take the chip. Okay? You're going to be shamed for not complying, just like so many people are getting shamed for not wearing a mask in a store. Here's another article. Farther ahead, I quote, farther ahead, the tags will provide a determined person with the means to track your every move. Beth Given of the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse in San Diego, California, right here locally, if we establish a robust credit card network based on RFID chips, implanted under the skin, we are also creating the infrastructure for government surveillance. That was from newscientist.com in 2003. Where are we 17 years later? Let me read you from Verichip's website. I got off of their website this week, front page of their website. I quote, Verichip is an injectable identification chip that can be inserted under the skin of a human being to provide biometric verification. Verichip, manufactured by Applied Digital Solutions, is about the size of a grain of rice. It holds an identification number, an electromagnetic coil for transmitting data, and a tuning capacitor. The components are enclosed inside a silicone and glass container that is compatible with human tissue. The chip, which uses an RFID wireless transmission technology, similar to the injectable ID chips, used by animal shelters to tag pets, can be read by a proprietary scanner up to four feet away. Verichip was originally intended to function in much the same way a medical alert device does by giving medical personnel life-saving information about a patient's history. It is now being used for security and automated data collection, as well as medical purposes, end quote. Let's take a look at where these things will typically be implanted, currently where they're implanted. Revelation 13, let me read this first before we go to that picture. Revelation, thir no, no, let's look at the picture. Let's go ahead, bring that picture up. So you see in the right hand, and you see the chip. See how small it is, that little Vera chip right there, right? Typically it's going to be, let's go to the next slide. That is entry, it's like a fob in your person, on your person, beep. It, it'd be just like you can get your whole credit card, your whole life is on that little chip. Look how tiny it is, fits in the, the end of your finger. And you just go up and you wanna pay for something, you just go beep, and you just pay for it, just like that. Now some people are like, what's wrong with that? I kinda like that, it's convenient. I don't have to carry my credit card or anything like that. Well, it, 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 you, you're, you have no option at that point. Surveillance happens, like you are under control. And you got to be careful. Revelation 13, 16 through 18 says it like this. It also forced it, Antichrist, all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Revelation 18, 13, 18. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. Six, six. Again, not saying you're going to have that 
you, not you, but people that will be here during the tribulation, Mark 666. That's not it. And I'm going to explain why right here. Okay, because you got to calculate. He says to calculate the number of the beast. Now, you have to understand Hebrew to grasp this. The Hebrew language does not have separate symbols for numbers, but it assigns a numerical value to the letters of the alphabet. Are you still with me? Are you awake? All right. Okay. So this means that the consonants of a word can be added together. Remember John who wrote Revelation said you need to calculate. Okay. He's calculating to achieve a number that can then be used as a numeric symbol for that word or that name. So if you transliterate the Greek, remember the New Testament was originally written in the Greek language. So if you transliterate the Greek into Hebrew consonants, the numerical value is 666. The numerical value for that name, beast. If you transliterate the Greek word for beast into Hebrew consonants, the numerical value is 666. So that's the idea. The number of the beast, it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Sometimes I think people are looking for that actual number out there. Like, oh, that's when we'll know it's happening. It's not even going to be like that. Okay, so now as I close, I want you to remember, Jesus Christ has given the, us this information to prepare us. It's so important that we're prepared for what's coming. So I'm going to close up with two practical things I want you to write down. Here's what we need to do, because you have to remember... We will not be here for all of this chaos. Isn't that awesome in the mercy of Jesus? We will be captured by the rapture, baby. All right. What do you do now? Here's what I'd say for those that don't quite understand this or get this. You got to wake up. Wake up. Okay. Wake up to what is going on. Wake up to the things happening around you. We cannot be automatons and just go along with whatever they say. Okay, I guess we got to do that. I can't see my family. I can't go out in the world. I can't. I got to wear a mask. I got to stay away from people. I can't do anything. I can't have any freedoms. First two months, absolutely, right? We're like, hey, we don't know what's going on here. Absolutely. But man, once we got the data, once we understood what was going on, folks, <laughs> we're over six months into this thing. You realize that? And we're being told it's going to get worse this week? Nothing happens. Nothing changes, as I already mentioned, until you push back. Do not consent. If you're wondering, where do you get these stats, Jeremy? Go on my blog. Okay, I, I list all the stats. I list all the stuff that's going on. You can get the data yourself. Go on there, look at my blog, read, especially the, the article I wrote on Face the Facts. You'll look at the facts there, and you'll be able to see that. Okay, so wake up to that, what's going on. You see a couple of verses there. Then be ready. Be ready. What do you mean be ready? Keep coming to church. Keep growing in faith. Keep learning. Keep worshiping Jesus Christ, our Savior. Make sure you continue to do that, and you will be confident that you are ready because Jesus has told us, see, I have told you beforehand. We really have no excuse. He's told us. The reason that we're going through this difficult subject and long is because we want to make sure we are a church that Jesus Christ is proud of. A church not like the church that I put the reference there in Revelation 3, 14 through 20, which was the church at Laodicea, that he condemned for being a lukewarm church. He said, you're neither hot nor cold. I'm just going to spit you out of my mouth. I'd, I'd rather you hot or you're cold, but you're neither. And we don't want to be that. We want to be on fire hot for the Lord Jesus and what he wants us to do. Okay? Amen? Amen. Remember this quote, evil is powerless if the good are unafraid. Evil is powerless if the good are unafraid. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for your word. It gives us confidence. We don't have to walk around in constant fear. We give you the praise for helping us bring clarity. Throughout this whole series, we're trying to bring clarity. We're trying to bring truth to a world where truth has just gone off the edge. It's gone. So help us to continue to be strong, preach the truth, tell others the truth. We thank you for that. If you're here or you're within the sound of my voice and you have never said yes to Jesus Christ, I want to give you that opportunity today by understanding the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
It is summed up in what we call the ABCs of salvation. A is to admit you're a sinner. Just admit you're not perfect. You don't have it all together. B is to believe that Jesus is the only one who can save you. Only he died for your sins. No one else. He paid for your sins. You just have to believe that. C is to choose to follow him for the rest of your life, one day at a time. If that's you, you would say, yeah, I need to do that. I want to encourage you to follow me in this prayer in the silence of your heart, very simply. Say, dear Jesus, I am a sinner. I've made mistakes. I have not lived a perfect life. I believe that you are the only one who can save me. I trust in your sacrifice on the cross for my sins, and I believe you rose again. You beat death for me. And I'm going to choose to follow you for the rest of my life. I don't even know what that all means. But every day I'm going to put one foot in front of another. I need your strength to be able to do that. If you said that, Jesus heard it. I want to encourage you to mark the box that's on your connection card there, the digital connection card that says, I said yes to Jesus today. Others of you, it's time to recommit your life to Jesus. You'd say, I'm a Christian, but man, I've been drifting. I've been, like it says there in the Bible, in kind of a drunken stupor, just, just going through life, not awake. Then I want to encourage you to recommit your life to Jesus Christ today by saying these words. In your heart, he can hear you. Dear Jesus, I want to know you. I ask you to come into my life. God, help me to stay stronger this time. I'm sorry for drifting away. I need you. I need your strength and your wisdom. Give me the strength to walk closer. If you said that, would you mark the connection card there on your digital connection card on the app? Just mark, I recommit my life to Jesus today. Lord, we sure love you. We thank you and we give you the praise. Protect us, guide us, and direct us as you've promised to. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said? Amen. Amen. Put your hands together for the Lord. Thank you.